Good evening, everyone. I know that some of you are still getting pizza. Please do so. Those of you who want a second or third or fourth slice, please go and get that while I'm talking. I want to keep this very informal. I think we have some folks online. And so for those of you who are online, I do hope you ordered pizza to your kitchen table this evening. Um, my name is Ed Schlesinger. I'm the Benjamin T. Rome Dean of the Whiting School of Engineering. Welcome to what I believe is our first ever uh, Engineering for Professional uh, Student Town Hall uh, meeting. Uh, my purpose in, in having this meeting with you all really is just to tell you a little bit about the school that you're part of and uh, then to answer any questions that you might have about uh, EP, about the Whiting School, about anything that you care to ask me about. And so uh, let's start uh, by my telling you a little bit about the school, if you don't mind. You will, after all, be graduates of the Whiting School. You will be alums of the Whiting School. You should, I hope, be very proud of that. And uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about the school that you're part of. The first thing is that I think of our core mission as being threefold. I think of our core mission as being research, education, and translation. And I think translation, especially standing in a place like the Applied Physics Laboratory, is very, very important to what defines us as engineers. Uh, research may be an obvious uh, uh, um, core mission of a, of a research university. Education, obvious core mission of, a, of, a, of any university. But I think translation is what makes us engineers. If we don't translate what we do, into something that has impact in society, we may be outstanding scientists, but what makes us engineers is that we translate what we do, we solve a problem, we bring it to society. And so that's very important to me. And translation is really broadly, broadly construed. Translation doesn't necessarily mean creating a startup company. That's one, one manifestation of translation. Translation uh, is building a system. It may be for government purposes, it may be for corporate purposes. Translation is also about uh, launching educational programs, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the community, and translating our educational mission to having impact in society. So translation is a very broadly construed um, area in my mind, but it is core to what makes us engineers. Let me give you some facts and figures, and I promise there is a watch on my wrist, if not in the, on the wall here, and I will keep track of the time, and I'll try to make sure to finish within 20 minutes or less so we have plenty of time for questions and answers. And if you have any questions for me along the way, by all means, just put up your hand, and, and if I'm not looking in your direction, just shout, okay? Send up a flare. So, how big is the Whiting School of Engineering? Like any complex organization, it's all about how you count. If you want to count all the faculty in the Whiting School, we have about 166 tenure-track faculty members. That includes all of our Bloomberg Distinguished Professors, uh, counted as one, even though the Bloomberg Distinguished Professors have appointments in multiple departments. In addition, we have about 28 research faculty, 43 um, research scientists, 34 teaching-track faculty, and then, of course, the biggest group of uh, faculty that we have is the in the engineering for professionals program although obviously most of those folks are not full-time faculty in the Whiting School. What is very important about the engineering for professionals uh, program and the faculty that populate uh, that is that many many of them at least half of them are uh, members of the technical staff here at the applied physics lab and that really makes our engineering for professionals program as a continuing professional uh, master's program, I think unique in the country, that we have the quality of people who work at the Applied Physics Lab teaching professionals, working professionals, uh, and enhancing their, their educational uh, background. And I think that is a tremendous advantage that we have. In terms of students, we have about 1,800 undergraduates full-time on the Homewood campus. You can see how that's divided between freshmen, sophomore, juniors. I'll have more to say about that. We have about 483 full-time master's students, residential pro, uh, students, about 2,500 um, uh, folks in the Engineering for Professionals program, and about 723 PhD students, and that number includes 
Uh, that 723 includes the PhD students who are in the biomedical engineering program, uh, even though their PhD degree is officially awarded by the School of Medicine. One of the interesting things about the Whiting School is that our biomedical engineering program is shared or sits in both the engineering school and in the School of Medicine. So it's actually a fairly so uh, sizable engineering program uh, as engineering programs go for, uh, um, in, especially in, in, in private universities. Uh, rankings matters. Actually, they don't matter, but they matter. Uh, they don't matter because it really is odd to try to sum up a complex organization um, with a single number. It matters because, uh, and if you want to see the absurdity of that, how many of you know something about material science? Okay, if I were to ask you, what's the number one material in the world? What's the number two material in the world? That's a ridiculous question. You know, what's your application? What are you using it for? I mean, you could go on and on and on. It's a little bit what rankings for, of universities are like. On the other hand, students, parents of students, friends of students, all ask, how are you ranked? And so, you kind of have to look at it. So this is our graduate rankings. Uh, one of the things that you can see there is, here's the Engineering for Professionals program. And as you can see, over the years, we have significantly improved in this US News and World Report rankings. I'm using that, there's many rankings out there, but this is the one that people often refer to. And in the Computer Information Technology, also the NEP program, you see we're now two years in a row, we're fifth in, ranked fifth in the country. Turns out, uh, there's some idiosyncrasies of the way these rankings are, are calculated, which affects where you end up. But this is very, very nice, uh, a nice place to be. Uh, you can see also biomedical engineering is number one. Um, environmental engineering is in the top 10. And some of these other ones that I've highlighted are ones that I think you can see over the years have, you know, if you, you kind of look sideways and squint a little bit, you can kind of tell that maybe, maybe there's an improvement over time. These are all purely reputational purely what people think of you. So there's, there's really not much to them in terms of numbers. Um, actually, the engineer for professionals, they have some numbers in them. But much, all of these other ones are reputational. Over time, it gives you a sense of what people think of the school and how aware they are of it. This is the undergraduate rankings. And, the, and um, what's interesting, again, is biomedical engineering has always been number one, continues to be number one. Environmental uh, engineering in the top 10. Many of our undergraduate programs simply aren't ranked. Again, I say they're, they're, they're just, they just don't receive a number. Uh, it's purely reputational and it's a question of whether people decide to check off a box or not. If you look at the research funding in the Whiting School, this is sort of the trend over the years. This number is the total activity and that's the one I look at because of, of idiosyncrasies of the accounting practices when Funding that PIs in the Whiting School are responsible for are expended by parts of the university other than the Whiting School. They don't get, that, that funding doesn't get counted, except I count it up here. And so you see we have about $113 million of, of um, funded research in the Whiting School on an annual basis. Not APL scale. APL is, I think, a little bit larger than that but very respectable for a school of our size. And what's really nice is that it's been going up significantly in the last few years. If you look at where it's coming from, that also tells an interesting story about the Whiting School. You can see that there's a nice mixture. First of all, National Institute of Health is a significant fraction of our overall funding, as is Department of Defense. But what you see is that we have a nice portfolio between NIH, NSF, DOD, other federal agencies, uh, private sources, and so forth. So, so a nice mixture of, of, of where funding is coming from, a nice portfolio. The reason, by the way, you care about all this, if you're sitting here wondering, as a student, why do I care about all of this? You care about all this because, to some extent, the value of your degree resides in the reputation of the school. And so it's nice to know that you're coming from, and you will be graduates of, or if you're not already graduates of, uh, of a highly regarded school of engineering. And so that's why you care about all this. We also have a fairly uh, active um, IP portfolio, a growing IP portfolio. This shows you how it's been growing over the years 
in terms of inventions, invention filings, licensed inventions, and so forth. Of course, as patents run out after 17 years or so, they are taken out of this. And so the fact that it continues to rise means that the rate at which patents IP is being produced is greater than the rate at which it's being lost uh, over time. Let's talk about you guys, the engineering for professional students and programs. We have currently 18 degrees, 18 degree fields. The ones that are in red are the ones that are now available to students online. That is a growing uh, element in our um, portfolio. Quite a number of students, quite a number of faculty members, a number of industry partners. One of the things that's interesting, I don't have to tell you this, the average age of uh, students in the EP program is 31, meaning that this, the Engineering for Professional Programs is serving a different population than our full-time and master's program at the Homewood campus. It's truly engineering program for people who, for the most part, are already in the professional field. This is sort of the breakdown of which are the most popular majors within engineering for professionals. Computer science, systems engineering, ECE, UC are the top, but significant enrollments in, in the other programs as well. And this is perhaps the most interesting. The red dots and their size indicate, and this is from about 10 years ago, students who are online in the Engineering for Professionals program. And so what you can see is that there were some students online on the West Coast, some in the central part of the country, some students online even in the uh, Baltimore, D.C. area. Ten, go f forward 10 years, this is where the students are now that are online. In fact, I think I'm correct in saying that over 70% now of the enrollments are online enrollments. And what's really interesting is that students who could come here in person, many of them are choosing to go online because I think it's just convenient uh, for people, especially working professionals, to do that. And so it's an interesting evolution of the Engineering for Professionals program from a primarily face-to-face -face kind of program to a predominantly online kind of program. And that has implications for the Whiting School. If you want to look at the full-time students and programs, because they too are alums of this university, they are your, your network, alumni network, and by the way, whenever you hear about an alumni event for the Whiting School, you should know you're invited. You are alums of the Whiting School when you get your degree. And it's actually a valuable thing to be a member of the alumni network, because after all, it's a lot easier to talk to someone if you say, oh, you went to Hopkins, so did I. I've got a degree from Hopkins. Before you know it, it's a valuable networking opportunity as you go through your career. So this is an eye chart, but what I want to show you in this eye chart is the quality of the undergraduates that we're admitting and how it's been improving and changing over the years. This is the last five years. These are the early decision applicants. This is the regular decision applicants, and this is the total for the Whiting School. Focus on this last number, this last part. The number of applicants in the last five years for the Whiting School, these are undergraduates. Now those of you who are, I'm looking at the faces here, I think some of you might have enough gray hair to have kids who are potential undergraduates. So as, as a dean of an engineering school, I love these numbers. As a parent of a high school student who's gonna be applying about a year from now, these numbers make me lose sleep at night because this is what's happening. Total number of applicants to the, for the Whiting School up from 5,000 five years ago to over 8,000 now. The number we admit, instead of 27% admission rate, 11%. The average SAT score of the students who come to the school, 1492 last year. Their average high school GPA is at 3.91. And I'll tell you something, we already did the early decision class for this coming fall. In the early decision class, this number is 1507. This GPA is 3.93. 45% women. We're almost at 50-50, male, female. So, I don't know, as, a, as I say, as a dean, I love it. As a parent, I lose sleep. I notice there's at least one parent sitting there. But it says something about the quality of the students that come into our program. So if we just don't do any harm, they'll be great when they graduate. <laughs> if you look at where we are by gender across the Whiting School, at the undergraduate level, we're about one-third female as a school of engineering, which is above the national average. 
I keep telling our admissions folks, the day we admit 50-50 men, women, is the day we'll have a little headline in the paper. But I think we're going to get there. I think we're getting there. If you look at the full-time program, so even as the Engineering for Professionals program has been growing, what you see here is the application numbers growing tremendously. What, from 941, about six years ago, to what is that number? Almost 2,700 applicants just last year for our master's program. The total size has grown a little bit from the last few years. It's grown significantly over the last six years. But what you can see is that very selective, tremendous interest in our programs. That's what it tells you. So these guys are getting master's degrees. You guys are getting master's degrees. So it's good to be part of, the, part of a good school. Uh, PhDs, as I said, the number is, is about 700 and some. What I've shown you here is, uh, as of fall 2015, how many PhD students we have per faculty member. <coughs> Uh, in the Whiting School. For me, the magic number is about five PhDs per faculty, uh, faculty member, because that means that people, on average, that means that people are graduating about one PhD student per year per faculty member. That's kind of where you want to be. If you look at the demographics of our faculty, we've been doing quite a bit of hiring in recent years. I expect this number to actually increase in the coming years. So those are the facts and figures. Let me just finish off by telling you a little bit about some initiatives in the Whiting School that you should know about. And from there, just take any questions or discussion of anything. So one important, interesting initiative, we have a new Kavli Center for Neuroscience Discovery. The Kavli Institute, or Kavli Institute, not Kavli Center, is an endowed institute. It's a, uh, it includes both the um, Whiting School, School of Medicine, the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. One of the co-directors is Mike Miller. Mike Miller is also the director of the Center for Imaging Science. And this center, uh, this institute, will be working on issues of neuroscience and neuroengineering and includes also the Applied Physics Lab, Public Health. Um, and you can see their goal is a unified understanding of brain function. That's neuroscience. And then our ability to manipulate that, that's neuroengineering. And so that's a very in, uh, exciting initiative. Another one that we just announced last Friday is the establishment of the Malone Center for Engineering and Healthcare in the Whiting School. This is a center that's going to be focused on um, bringing engineering concepts, engineering ideas, an engineering way of thinking to, the, to healthcare and medicine. I think engineers have a lot, of, a lot to offer in that realm. I think it's an area of growing importance, and so this center will be focused on that. Another initiative is the Barclays School partnership that we have. The Barclays School is a pre-K to eight Baltimore City public school. It's not a magnet school. It's not a charter school, just a plain vanilla neighborhood elementary school. Uh, we're partnering with that school. We've made a 10-year commitment. We've built some engineering laboratories there and we've committed to having the entire pre-K through eight curriculum focus heavily on engineering and use engineering as a vehicle to teach kids how to read, to teach kids how to do math, to teach social science, to teach geography, uh, but use engineering as sort of the motivating paradigm in which to do that. And as I say, it's a 10-year commitment because I wanted to be in a, in a position to be able to say to the parents of kids coming into the pre-K program that Hopkins Engineering will be there even when your child graduates. And quite frankly, what we're hoping to do is have this school be so improved that it improves the neighborhood. What I didn't say is that that school is only a mile and a half from the Homewood campus. Maybe not even a mile and a half, maybe only a mile. And so there are neighbors, and uh, if we can help that school be better, then maybe the neighborhood will improve. And in some sense, it's enlightened self-interest. And our, then the neighborhood next to Hopkins is kind of better. and That's good, too. But anyway, it's the right thing to do. So that's an important initiative. And we are going through a strategic planning exercise right now, thinking about what do we mean when we say education? What do we mean when we say research? What do we mean when we say translation? What are our important goals within those three areas? And what are the strategies to execute to get us to those goals? And that's clearly something that's going to involve heavily the Engineering for Professionals program, because Engineering for Professionals, in terms of everything it does, is central to the educational mission of the Whiting School. And that's my prepared remarks. And now I'd love to have a discussion, answer questions from anyone. Yes, sir. Uh, so 
In, in um, lacking in what sense, in terms of? There is no mathematics PhD program and other PhD programs that are not available for part-time students. Ah, for part-time students. OK, yes, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to work on that. And it turns out that um, there are certain surprising administrative issues, which I am nibbling away at one at a time. So one of the things that I've uh, changed uh, is the definition of residency. So residency now means that full tuition has been paid for at least one year. We will not be looking for people to see if they are physically resident. We hope they will be. But I have no way of, 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 of enforcing that. And so I think we need to be a little bit more flexible in what we mean by residency. The only thing we can measure is whether or not tuition has been paid. Um, another aspect of this that should be implemented this fall is that there has been a tradition on the Homewood campus that graduate students taking graduate courses receive no credit hours for those courses. Now that turns out to be a problem for some part-time students in terms of getting reimbursed and, and so forth. So as of this fall, Whiting courses for graduate students taking graduate courses will have credit hours. And that will help alleviate that. But I am interested in growing our part-time PhD program, especially cognizant of the opportunity that we would have with the Applied Physics Lab. And so I think that's an important trying to shift that over. Thanks. Yes, sir. There's students in engineering for professionals who are uh, working two jobs or maybe taking loans to pay for their fee. Not, uh, not everybody gets the fee paid by their employers. And I see, as, as somebody who's going to graduate very soon, I see that for, for a student who wants a career shift or a new job after the, after the master's degree, there's no assistance from either the career office or the advisor regarding counseling, career guidance, or uh, how to find a new job. Is that uh, going to change in the future? Do you have any plans to so, update uh, that? So, so, so two answers to that question. The first is, um, I think there's a lot of work yet to be done in terms of improving the career center on the Homewood campus in general. Uh, I think um, that for all sorts of historical reasons. Uh, we, we, we are currently in the midst of looking for a director of the Career Center. But having said that, the Engineering for Professionals program, uh, while it has some career assistance, I think it's something that we need to be very, very mindful of be, for the reasons exactly that you said, which is that one of the reasons people come into such a program is to sort of retool themselves for a new career path. And so I think it is incumbent on us to improve our career services for the engineering for professional students. It's more challenging because it's a little bit more um, distributed, and especially if you saw that map, now that our students literally are across the country, how do we make sure to offer career services at a distance? Well, we figure out how to offer education at a distance, so we need to be able to do that as well. Yes. Uh, some time back, we had received a survey uh, where you had recommended changing the name of the program from engineering for professionals to something else. Um, some recommendations. There were some multiple. That there were some questions being asked, objective questions as to what we thought about the name. So, what was the outcome of that survey? So, so the the motivation for that survey was I felt so I should. You know, in the, in the um, spirit of full disclosure, I, um, I joined Johns Hopkins about two years ago. Two years ago, plus one month, plus one week. But who's counting? Um, 
And when I came to know the Engineering for Professionals program, um, it seemed to me that part of the brand, which is the Engineering for Professionals program, is that it is Johns Hopkins University. And that we weren't using that brand as, as, as um, what's the word I'm looking for? as centrally or as dominantly as we, we should. Because I think that's the value. It's Johns Hopkins University enjoys a tremendous reputation. It's, it's an amazing place. And so we need to make sure that people associate the Engineering for Professionals program with Johns Hopkins University. So while we haven't changed the name, I think it is fair to say that we are branding EP much more as the Johns Hopkins University Whiting School of Engineering Engineering for Professionals program. And we didn't find a name that captured all that sort of in a single, in a single, um, well, in a single name. But we're trying to make sure that people understand that this is the Johns Hopkins University Engineering for Professionals program. Uh, one more question, if you don't mind. Um, for the summer semester, I've been noticing that the number of courses offered are very small very little, is it because of less number of instructors available or less number of students enrolling during summer? That's a good question. I actually would ask Dexter if there's an obvious answer for why in the summer there's somewhat fewer courses. Is it just an instructor? It's yeah. a somewhat related to instructors, it's also just related to supply and demand that many of our students don't seem to want a lot of courses in the summer, although last summer we were up in a sixty percent over the, the summer before. So So the, the, the short answer is we will offer more courses if we see that the demand is there and if we're able to, to, uh, to supply those courses. I think one of the strengths of Engineering for Professionals as a program is that relative to the more traditional bricks and mortar kind of program, um, it is more flexible and able to respond more quickly to, to changes in the landscape. And frankly, I think that's one of the things that it brings to the Whiting School that if we didn't have the Engineering for Professionals program, we'd have to invent it because we would want that flexibility and that ability to respond, if you will, to the market uh, more quickly. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Hi. Hi. Oops, I have a quick question. I know some students are not being sponsored by their employees, so are there any opportunities for scholarships or any type of fellowships um, within the program? So we are, uh, we are looking into the op whether there are such opportunities available for us. Um, scholarships um, are generally available to students in bricks and mortars institutions because they have been endowed by um, alums. And so on the one hand, we have more alums from the Engineering for Professional program than we probably do from our full-time residential program, despite sheer numbers. Uh, but that is an interesting question of whether we can get some of those alums, many of whom are tremendously successful, to maybe think about um, helping us uh, build the endowment that would allow us to, to offer that. And I have one more quick question. With the elementary school initiative you mentioned earlier, are there any opportunities in the future for maybe students to get involved and volunteer? Oh yeah, oh yeah, there absolutely are. In fact, if you're interested in volunteering, um, then you should contact our Center for Educational Outreach. I didn't talk about it here. The Whiting School is actually unique, I think, in the schools of, amongst schools of engineering. We have a Center for Educational Outreach within the Whiting School with a director, with a staff, with a budget. It's been, it's a sort of a self-sustaining uh, center. It's spearheading our efforts with the Barclay School. They also do, just so that you know, they also do um, uh, an engineering innovation program. It's a summer high school program that reaches about 500 kids now every summer uh, uh, to, to introduce high school kids to engineering. Um, so if you're interested in volunteering, by all means, contact the Center for Educational Outreach in the Whiting School. However, what I will say is they're very, very systematic about this. And I, so they're looking for commitment. 
They're not looking for, yeah, I can come out there one Sunday, one, you know, once every three weeks maybe. They, they, they're very, very systematic. So they're looking for volunteers who are saying, yes, this is something I really want to do. So if you're interested in that, by all means contact them, but they'll, they'll have high levels of expectation. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. Um, how do you compare this uh, engineering for professional program to the full-time um, master's program from the, the university? And is it accredited as the like, same um, standards as the full-time on the campus? Um, so, okay, so how do I compare it? As a, um, as a program, I would say, that, so, so I would say in terms of demand, intellectual demand, rigor, and so forth, yes, it's exactly at the same level, without doubt, without doubt. I would say that one of the things that's good about the program or interesting about the program is that given that we are dealing with students who, as you saw, their average age is older, they're coming from a different background, I think it tends to be more um, systems oriented. It has a somewhat more, um, maybe by the nature of the instructors, more of a of a view uh, that is, well actually, I have no other way of saying this, more hardcore engineering in terms of its point of view. And I say that as a positive thing, that, 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 that you've got real engineers teaching other real engineers. And I think that's, that's really a powerful paradigm. As opposed, to, as opposed to a program where you might just take your regular full-time faculty uh, who simply teach what they teach on campus in the same way. So, it, so there's a different flavor, but, um, but it's clearly intellectually as challenging and academically as rigorous. Uh, in terms of uh, accreditation, we meet whatever accreditation standards we have to meet. Yes? I'll, 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 while you're getting the mic over there, I will say one thing that I think the uh, EP program does Probably, you know, accreditation often is about assessment, and one of the things the EP program does very, very well is, uh, is actually have a feedback system for the assessment of the quality of the programs, the quality of instruct instruction. Uh, that's done very, very systematically and very well within the Engineering for Professionals program, and it has consequence in terms of changing things. Yes? I was wondering what your current goals and plans are as far as getting the EP programs that are not currently fully available online, getting those, particularly the ACM program, um, to where they are fully available online. Um, so my personal plan is to, re is to keep encouraging the folks who, who run the EP program to get as many of the programs online as we possibly can. Um, of course, there are going to be certain programs that require a certain face-to-face -face, uh, experience uh, just by nature of I don't know how to offer a laboratory experience online, not quite yet. Uh, I think the applied biomedical engineering is a good example of that where there is a requirement to come to the campus. But generally speaking, whatever we can take online, we will. I think I might use that as a springboard to another uh, question or another um, priority that's on my mind, I'd like to see more of our residential programs and the EP programs sort of intermingled a little bit. What I'd really like to see ultimately is that there's an opportunity for a student to say, you know, Whiting Engineering offers me a spectrum of opportunities from full-time, fully residential to part-time, completely online, and everything in between. And I, as a student, can customize my program in a way that's best for me. So if I got a semester where I can go full time and be on the campus, I can do that. And then the next semester, go online part time and do whatever. And so I'd like to see us get that integration across the spectrum. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. There's programs now that are interacting more and more. And by the way, it works both ways. It also works for the residential students who maybe finish eight out of, their, out of their 10 courses, and they say, hey, I've got, a, I've got a job now in California, but through the EP program, I can finish those last two courses while I'm starting to work in California. So I think there's opportunities there through a full integration. 
Yes. I'm, I'm assuming a Broncos fan. Uh, oh, the hair. I can't see it, so. Uh, <laughs> I'm just assuming. I, I bet on the Broncos just because the puppies uh, from uh, the comedy show said that the Broncos are going to win, so. And what? I bet on them. Apparently yeah. better than the odds makers in Vegas. The yeah. puppies know, yeah. yeah. Um, my question uh, is actually more solution based, which is probably contrary to what my SE instructors want me to say, but um, it kind of expands on his uh, comments about summer curriculum open uh, or availability for classes. and. I have a very tight uh, time frame to participate here, and I've found that that has constrained me in regards to the options mm -hmm. and that customizability, customization. Um, and you and you're vocalize uh, an ability to kind of make the program what you want. Um, That's so my dream. Your dream. Yes. Well, uh, a suggestion or maybe a place of opportunity in that, and my request to you for the academic department to consider would be. Uh, maybe somewhere on the Engineering for Professionals website to have availability for students to express interest in a class availability mm. for the next semester, um, whether that be the summer, like fall, that. or spring. Um, and then, because you wouldn't want to necessarily commit with people backing out, uh, maybe uh, like you have early admissions, it'd be an early commitment for a class where you uh, do some type of monetary thing or something to commit. But uh, my curriculum, in, in part, is based on just pure availability of courses. Mm -hmm. um, and summer curriculum, uh, I've encountered with a number of students, is in particular trying because a lot of electives or prerequisites aren't available at the period where they need it. Um, wh whether or not that's uh, Johns Hopkins requirements or their work requirements also causing some interference, um, maybe that would be something valuable yeah. to oh, that's consider. A, I, like, I like this idea, yeah. Oh. yeah Thank it, you for the positive feedback. Yeah. Although it's been, uh, it's been great, but the uh, I, I would agree. Summer is in, in particular challenging, and then course availability due to the structures of the prerequisites sometimes can cause limitations. But it absolutely would help us to know. So, so yeah, some sort of system. I think, I think with computers today, we might be able to do this. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's an excellent idea. Thank you. Thank you. I'm enrolled in the uh, master's program in cybersecurity, and when I enrolled a couple of years ago, I made that decision largely based on the reputation of the university, if not necessarily the program. Mm -hmm. How do you think the cybersecurity program at Hopkins compares to others in the area? Where do you think it will be in a few years? So, I think we have a very strong cybersecurity program. I think our Johns Hopkins Information Security Institute uh, on the Homewood campus is quite strong. I don't. I hope I don't have to tell you that there's an awful lot of expertise in cybersecurity, very practical, real world expertise in cybersecurity here in the Applied Physics Laboratory. Um, I would expect our program to grow. We have hired uh, faculty members in that area um, in recent last couple of years. Um, I think it's going to be only growing and strengthening. I don't want to say more than that. Um, You know, I, I prefer not to compare one program to another, because what am I going to tell you? I'm going to tell you that ours is the best, right? So, but, but, uh, but we do have some outstanding people in our program. It has strengthened in the last couple of years in terms of our ability to hire, and it will continue to do so. So just a follow-up question to that. I noticed that the core selection is not as, maybe as extensive as I would like it to be. Is that going to change? Well, I think it's a question of, again, supply and demand, and our ability also to provide the supply, uh, the instructors. Uh, that's not an easy area, because those people with that expertise are in very high demand. You're in a very good program in the sense that after you're done, you'll, 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 you'll do whatever you want. Uh, but some of the ideas I just heard about maybe having a kind of a market to let us know what, what, where the demands are. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. One thing that would encourage all the students to do is to talk to their advisor and to your program chair, because they know all these answers. They know what the course availability will be in, for the next two years, for example. They can help you do your planning. Uh, and so, I would also ask your advisor and your program chairs if there's something, if you're tight on your schedule, uh, I would ask for a waiver. 
instead of taking this one elective, maybe you could get a waiver to take a similar elective. But again, we have a, a, a pretty good system in place of, of advisors, program chairs who have program committees, and they know all these mm. answers, and they can do a lot to help you with your planning. And, 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 and to the extent that they know, we'll talk about this. Uh, uh, Dr. Smith and myself, we, we, we get together on a regular basis. Um, I, I, I'm very much a proponent of complete transparency where, um, wherever possible. And if we have a good idea of what we're going to be offering over the next few semesters, I see no problem trying to have some sort of dynamic system that we can just publish that and let people know. And so maybe part of the problem would be just knowing, you know, that two summers from now something is going to be offered. And if you, or vice versa, gee, it's not going to be offered, then maybe I go to the other system where I try to put a pitch in to get it offered. But we can, we can implement those. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm an instructor in an online program in Applied Biomedical Engineering. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm an instructor in Applied Biomedical Engineering. And as an instructor, I get a lot of queries from international students who are actually out of the country um, trying to, I don't know how do they find my courses, but they uh, ask questions whether they can be admitted into the program. So is there any plan for expanding this uh, national map into international uh, uh, thing? That's my first question. Mm -hmm. And the second question is I often get queries from students, some of them I see here, um, uh, about our research programs. Uh, we have uh, in Applied Biomedical Engineering two semesters worth uh, research project courses. And so I was wondering if there is uh, any amount of funding availability or something like that, any uh, financial support for the student to perform research. Um, because often uh, there is a limited resources for that kind of work. Uh, if some students wants to, if some student wants to come over to the lab uh, almost every evening and do some research, yeah. uh, the, I get a lot of queries like that. So first of all, about the international, uh, I, I would say that we already are seeing some students um, coming online to our programs from overseas. Um, it's a small number. But I think whereas it might have been zero five years ago, it's non-zero now. Um, I would like to see our international footprint grow. And we're looking at some opportunities. Uh, but we have to, if, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. And we're going to do it in a manner that, that makes sense for us and makes sense for the international students. Um, difficult to see how to do such things if there's a very short but required physical presence in the US, that becomes problematic both from a logistics point of view and, and, and visa point of view and things like that. So, so I'm not exactly sure how to do that. With respect to doing research, uh, I, at least for US citizens, I believe I'm correct when I say that the Applied Physics Lab uh, has some summer internship opportunities for master's students. I'm, pretty sure of that. I'm looking at some of my colleagues here from APL. Yeah. And so there is that. I don't know that we have any funding available sort of for a standalone individual point uh, research efforts. Something to think about. Um, not exactly sure how to fund something like that. But, um, but those internships are there in APL for the, for the US citizens and permanent residents. Yes, sir. Both AAP and EP, uh, there are certain courses which, is, which has courses in both Homeward as well as in APL. So certain, and it has a sizable amount of international students too who stay at the Homeward campus. Yeah. Like how we have a shuttle between the Homeward campus and the medical campus. Uh, in future, can we have anything for APL? Because it's very difficult for international students to do carpooling and to come. That's my first question. Second question, uh, uh, does APL allow uh, uh, international students to do internship at APL itself? So OK, so the first question, could we have a shuttle between APL and the Homewood campus? I'd like to have a shuttle between the Homewood campus and, a and, and APL for all sorts of reasons, uh, even for researchers to be able to 
you know, get on a shuttle and open up a laptop. Uh, by the way, the shuttle would have to have Wi-Fi on it, so you can open up your laptop and do some work rather than, than, than driving yourself. It's not that long a trip if you've got your car, but it'd be nice if there was a shuttle. That's purely a, a cost versus demand kind of uh, question. And as far as I know, when it's been looked at, um, the, the, it's been cost prohibitive and, and, and not, not easy to, to put into place. I'm not saying it's out of the question, but we haven't put it into place. Uh, with respect to internships at APL for non-US citizens, non-permanent residents, um, I think that's currently not available, but I also know that APL is growing certain organizations that are possibly going to be able to do that, but I don't want to speak for APL, but I, I, I believe that they're, uh, I, I'm looking at my colleagues here, the Center for uh, the Intelligence Systems Center, I think it's a little bit outside of the, uh, the usual APL fence and might be something, but I don't know. So I would ask the APL folks. Right, but I don't know if that means that they can take non-U.S. interns. Do they? You have to realize that if, if I'm a program manager here at APL, which I have been in the past, that if I have an intern, they have to come to work when the rest of my staff comes to work. It wouldn't be a part-time internship you know from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. every night because you wouldn't overlap with the rest of the colleagues you'd be working on the project so internships for master students are really program by program I think undergraduate uh, there's a program now right for, for undergraduates, undergraduates there's a there's a, there's some summer programs for uh, Hopkins undergraduates yeah I think there was a question over here she's trying to be fair <laughs> okay oh okay um, I just, I think you might have touched on this with the waivers for the courses, but um, is there flexibility in sort of framing your concentration? I know that we have defined focus tracks, but uh, it seemed kind of rigid, and I was told by like an, the advisor that I had to take those five classes and I couldn't, you know, substitute or uh, get one wave to take. So, so without knowing all the details of all the programs, I don't claim to know all the details of all the programs, I will say this, uh, like any academic institution, and EP in the context of this, of this discussion is an academic institution, um, some programs are more rigid, some are more flexible, and it ends up always being a, a program by program and uh, department chair by department chair kind of decision based on the structure of the program. Uh, and what it does and doesn't allow. So I, I don't have a general answer for you. It also means that some of the, some of the uh, concentrations are approved by the Maryland Higher Education Commission, and you can't deviate very far from those. Yeah. Other ones like ECE has many kind of technical tracks. That's just for convenience. All the DSP courses are lumped together, all the communication systems. But you can take, with your advisor approval, any combination. But if it's an official area of concentration that will be put on your transcript, then it is a lot more rigid. Yeah. I think you said there was an online question. Uh, yes, uh, the question is, um, in this person's experience, um, courses are canceled due to low availability without much notice or awareness of how many students were enrolled and perhaps providing that information will be helpful. Um, she attends classes online and at the Southern Maryland Higher Education Center. And last summer, they recruited classmates to have a course over the summer that wasn't originally offered and it kept them on track. Okay, so, so the issue is about courses being uh, sort of canceled for lack of interest uh, at the last minute. And, and uh, this is something we're, 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 we're aware of uh, it is, again, one of those questions of supply and demand and our ability to match supply with demand. I think some of the ideas I heard today might help us with that. But we're at least aware of that, <coughs> aware of that situation and going to try to avoid it as best we can going forward. What time? We 
we promised to get everyone out of here by 7.30, and we're just a couple of minutes to, towards 7.30. Um, let me just say a couple of things. I mean, I think we've answered most of the questions, and some people have already had to leave. So let me just say a couple of things in closing. The first is, thank you all for being here tonight. I really appreciate your giving me the time to tell you something about the program that you're part of. I hope you, uh, um, I hope you are proud of being part of the Whiting School, part of Johns Hopkins University, and, and members specifically of the Engineering for Professionals program. Um, you should know that whenever you have questions or issues, there's always people to talk to. Your, 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 your instructor, your, your program uh, chairs, uh, you can send me an email, you can, you can send uh, Dr. Smith uh, 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 an email. Uh, we're here to help you guys. And also, I will reiterate, uh, we think of you we don't just think of you, you are our students and you will be our alums and we hope to uh, have a relationship with you for many, many years to come. And so uh, anything th that we can do to make the program better, we're, we're looking for those suggestions. So I appreciate the suggestions that were made today uh, and we'll try to work on, on those in the coming weeks and months. But thank you, thank you very much.